income or simply growth is a problem that has visited many a woman out there. And we want to dedicate today's shows on the ins and outs of uterine fibroid or growths in the womb and all the problems associated with it. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Bonitons House Corner here on SABC2. I'm Dr. Victor Ramatisil. Now, welcome to join our discussion on fibroids. And you can send your SMSs to Bonita's 33723. As always, we have invited in studio Dr. Ontantide Matlacha, who's a gynecologist and obstetrician at Nedke Malbatum Hospital, as well as Dr. Madipudem Sedeku, gynecologist, obstetrician, maybe. But at the Park Lane Clinic, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Both of them are very experienced in dealing in the diagnosis and the management of uterine fibroids in their own practices. Colleagues, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us this morning. You're welcome. I, I, I did laugh at the introduction, and when I come to Dr. Maripudem Seleko, I'm saying uh, uh, gynecologist and maybe obstetrician, because I know that you don't do obstetrics anymore. I don't do obstetrics anymore. Is it, it is because is of the recent issues related to... No, <laughs> my research is because of lifestyle. I okay. love it absolutely. I did it for more than 10 years. Um, but you know, as one gets older, one wants to slow down a bit. Mm. I decided to focus on the area of my profession that allows me to work more civilized hours. I see. Because now, uh, obstetrics can never be seven. <laughs> 24-7. Yeah. It's amazing that you're talking about getting older, but I mean, that, that is something that... <laughs> <laughs> you come from the younger generation. Mm. Sure, and I still okay. do obstetrics. Yeah, okay. uh, I don't mind being woken up any time of the day. Mm -hmm. I'm young and I'm ready. Okay. Mm. Yeah. But uh, the, the subject of the matter today, we are going to talk sure. about the uterine fibroid. Is it a common problem, sir? It is a very common problem. The, if you read the books or the literature, you get figures of around 25%. Mm -hmm. But I see, I, I would argue that I see even more uh, okay. patients who come and present with uterine fibroids. So it's quite common, yes. It is not a condition that is all, um, always symptomatic. In other words, you don't always know that you have uterine fibroids uh, unless you begin to have some complaint or by some chance you might pick it up on ultrasound or something like that. Am I correct that not most of them are actually asymptomatic? And Absolutely. I mean, it's quite fortunate for us women because it's very prevalent. I mean, a minimum of uh, one in five women have mm -hmm. fibroids. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, most of those women will not know that they've got them mm -hmm. because uh, you can have fibroids which are very non-cancerous, innocent growths inside the uterus. And if they're small and very few, um, you might just find that about them just by chance because mm. you're ill and you're being inv investigated for something else. Mm. When they do cause problems, also the severity of the problems vary uh, uh, greatly. They can present with uh, very mild bleeding, mild menstrual pains, but unfortunately in some women, and we don't know why they differ in how they present in some women, they can get very large, mm. numerous in number, and interfere not only with the menstrual bleeding and pain, but also interfere with fertility. So uh, it depends on in, in which women, how many are they, how big are they, and how they present what we need to do. Are they more common among Africans as opposed to other racial groups? Yes, if you go back to, to etiology, the, it's, it's poorly understood. Okay. There, there's a lot. There's etiology, a lot, what causes it? What causes the, okay. <laughs> the problem? There, there's yeah. a lot of uh, mm. what we don't know. Nice. But there's definitely associations. And there's definitely, like you said, in, in African women, we see it more than in the non-African women. Okay. And sometimes there's a geographical distribution that we do pick well, up. Why it's common in Arab yes. one as opposed to other parts For of example, the world. in Limpopo. Oh, you got more in Limpopo? many fibroids in Limpopo. They're I very know. rich. We have also roped in a specialist gynecologist in the studio, Dr. Pagwe, who's going to give us a biology 101 on uterine fibroids. Let's watch it. Fibroids is, is what we call them, but the ladies that come to me call them growth. So you might know it as a, as a growth. What fibroids are is it's actually a mess that happens or develops from a normal uterus. So this is what a normal uterus would look like. Uterine fibroids develop from this part of the uterus here. This is the smooth, smooth muscle of the uterus. So this smooth muscle, if you see it, is supposed to be in alignment. So it's supposed to be one muscle on top of another, on top of another. So in, you know, if, if you can imagine having an alignment like that, straight muscles like that. 
So what happens with the uterine fibroid, instead of having nice smooth muscles like this, you end up having this smooth muscles developing abnormally and forming a growth, forming a circular structure like that. And so instead of having a nice, nice aligned, you know, linear muscles, you end up having circular masses within the structure of the uterus. Anywhere in the structure of the uterus, that's where fibroids can develop. They can develop almost on the surface of the uterus, within this pink part, which is the endometrium, inside, uh, you know, centrally inside this muscle. So you will have different types, one on top, one within the endometrium, one centrally. If it's on top, it's called a sub serosal fibroid sub serosal just because it's under the surface this one is it's submucosal inside it's submucosal because it's next to the pink part to the endometrium and this one in the center is called an intramural fibroid and very rarely you will have one that's kind of very close to the vagina on the cervix it's important for us to note all these different positions of the fibroid because they present with different symptoms we will come back to the symptoms a little bit later. But uh, this, this model that we have on the table here, um, Dr. Ontati, is it, is it made to size uh, to the viewer? Is this what an average uh, uh, uterus or womb would, would, would almost, be equal to? Almost, almost, almost. A little mm. bit bigger. This is a little almost, bit bigger? Almost, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's how the normal, the normal womb would, mm. would would, would look like okay and and yeah like she she the, the insert uh, explained the, the tumors arise from the from the muscle layer the middle layer of, of the womb okay yeah. now this the mm -hmm. they can happen anywhere in the body where there's a muscle in this case it just happens to be a womb muscle or are they specific to this organ the interesting thing we know a lot about fibroids but we don't know yet. Uh, hopefully one of these days, one of our kids or grandchildren will answer this question about what exactly causes them. Mm. The uterus is a bag of muscle, made of smooth muscle cells. It's and a bag we of don't, muscle, it's nothing a, else. Yeah, yeah, it's a bag of, of, mm. of muscle. With a little bit of endometrium in the with middle. With a lining that bleeds, inside that bleeds, that once, bleeds a month, uh, once a month. And its, job, it's, angry, yeah, it's main pregnant. function okay. is to mm. carry a baby. Mm. Why some of these muscle fibers uh, develop into tumors, that means they grow independently of the other muscle fibers around them and grow now as an independent mass. And once they're formed now as an independent mass, they don't grow at the same rate okay. as the other muscle fibers around okay. them. They grow faster right. and they, they are predominantly identified and cause problems while we're young and fertile because they are stimulated by a f the female hormone called estrogen. So whilst a woman is young and, and healthy and fertile, these fibroids grow and grow and grow. Then after we reach menopause, when our estrogen levels drop, they stop growing. I see. But we don't know what causes them yet. So you wouldn't find them in a young girl of nine, eight, who have, who have mm. not started their periods just yet? No, no, no. I mean, that is virtually unheard of. Uh, it, it, it's a, a diagnosed in young, fertile women right. when estrogen levels have That's risen high enough. Yeah. Just, just before we continue with Dr. Parkway with the lectures that you've given us, mm. the relationship between fibroids and cancer of the uterus or of the womb, is there any? There, there isn't a direct cause and effect because most fibroids are benign. Are so benign. They are non in other words, they are non-cancerous. Yeah. There's, there's very few. In, a, in, 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 in one point five to 1%, mm. you'll find that they become sarcoma. Okay. They, be, they degenerate into... A, a malignant version okay. of the it's fibroid. Like cancer, That's yeah. the only time. The only other thing is that they are associated, like the uh, doctor has just said, with high levels of estrogen. So if you're going to have estrogen levels that, that's going to cause problems with the endometrium, the inside layer mm -hmm. of the womb, then the cancers can arise from there and there'll be an association. I see. But there is no direct cause. So you don't effect. remove them from the fear that they might turn into cancer at a later stage? No, mm -hmm. the, 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 the chances of a fibroid c becoming a cancer mm -hmm. is too small to make that a good enough or strong enough reason to actually remove them. Remove if, them. if a woman is just by chance found to have a fibroid, she doesn't have pain, she's not bleeding heavily, 
It's not stopping her from falling pregnant. It's not complicating her pregnancy. There's absolutely no need to alone. We must leave it alone. Okay. Now, let us go back to our resident lecturer, Dr. Ponzo Pakwe, to hear more about the symptoms of uterine fibroids. Let's watch. The symptoms include pain on your abdomen, below your umbilicus, that's where you would feel the pain. Your menstrual cycle, your monthly bleeding would be very, very painful and it would be quite heavy. In some ladies, the submucosal fibroids, the intramural fibroids can cause a delay in falling pregnant because you, you can see the relationship between this endometrium, the pink part, and where the fibroids would be. So if you have a fibroid that's sitting almost into the cavity of the uterus, that would delay pregnancy. And sometimes it would cause a blockage of these tubes. So you will have a bit of a delay in falling pregnant because it's sitting in the cavity and sometimes they can even block the tube. This is what we know. Fibroids are more common in black women than they are in white women. And that's because of the type of collagen that we have. So black women, the type of collagen tends to, pre to, to predispose to having fibroids. And then other things like the number of babies you've had. If you've had less babies, you are likely to have fibroids. If you started too late with your period, you tend to have, and this is called an exposure to estrogen. So all of those things that imply that you've had a longer exposure to estrogen tend to make you have fibroids. But quite often, they happen. You know, you'll, you'll find them happening in a young lady who's not necessarily been exposed to too much estrogen, and they happen in white ladies as well. So they happen, I mean, the true answer to you sitting at home is that they do happen, and, and the etiology is nothing that you could have done differently in your life that to prevent them or anything. If they're going to happen, they are there, and the, the good thing about it is they're not fate. We're gonna have to dedicate a show on this estrogen one day. I mean, it is such a problem, and yet it is what makes women, women. In the the final analysis. But fine. <laughs> now we have said, and you have said it with your own mom, Dr. Mseleku, that if the fibroid is sitting there, it is not causing any of these problems that are being you don't, you don't do, do anything, anything about it. it. And even what ultimately uh, will be done when something needs to be done is very different because it depends on what is that woman's problem. I see. So if a woman's main problem is that she's bleeding heavily, that's what we must focus on. If it's pain, that's what the target is. And sometimes it's because of the size. I mean, there are some women who probably out of denial and fear of finding out what is actually growing inside them will present with very big fibroids. I mean, to a point that they look like they're heavily pregnant. Mm. So in that case, when they're very big, then they might present also with pressure symptoms, that they're putting too much pressure on the bladder, too much pressure on the bowel, that they can't pass stools properly, it's interfering with urination. Then we might need to target that, the pressure. And then there's also a huge body of women that present with fibroids when they are struggling to fall pregnant. And, but it can must be taken that it's not always that a woman who's struggling to fall pregnant, who just happens to have a fibroid, mm -hmm. that it is a fibroid that's preventing her from falling pregnant. But it can certainly, based on where the fibroid is, they can block the fallopian tubes, but they don't always. Okay. We'll, talk, we'll talk about removal a little bit later, but before we go to the end break, what therefore determines the growth at which a fibroid is going, is going to, to, to develop. Because you do have small ones, and I've seen in many women, it's, that mm. it's not one, I mean, there are several, but they are all at different sizes. Now, there are those that would appear to be growing faster than others. What determines that? The, the true answer to that is that we don't know. Mm. There's a lot of mystery that surrounds the fibroid, mm. and I'm sure we're gonna, we're gonna leave it behind with all that mystery. The issue is, some women, you, you, you note, you can observe them, maybe check them every three months, every six months, and you can see the rate of growth, which will be different to the next person or the next patient. And so the, the, the rate of growth, how fast it grows, is, is never uniform. It's never the same for... for what is quite clear from what you both colleagues are telling me is that whatever solution you're going to come up with, based on the fibroid or fibroids that a woman has, must be designed for that specific individual, individual. and what Celestial her needs. individual needs are. And we'll come back to some of those needs after the break. One is Obama Chafu here, and I'll house go to long one. We'll concentrate on the diagnosis and treatment of uterine fibroids.
But first, let's look at the diagnosis and treatment of uterine fibroids. Let's watch. How do we find them? When you come to the gynecologist, we do a normal examination for you. And then after you've done a normal examination, clinically, just by examining and putting my hands on your tummy, when there are very big fibroids, I can, I can find them. But the investigations that we, we can do include a sauna. Uh, we can take you to the x-ray department and do a hysterosalpingogram, an HSG. So when you do that, it's, it's like putting a dye in here. So you're supposed to find a nice beautiful cavity like that. So if you have a subincosal fibroid, you will find it you'll find that the dye doesn't give you this form. So we can find it through a hysterosalpingogram and we can do an MRI as well. The treatment is we have operative modalities and we have non-operative modalities so we can treat it conservatively. If we treat it conservatively, it depends on what you have presented with. If the only presentation that you had come with was there's a bit of pain here and there and my periods are a bit you know, painful at times and you are just willing to take pain medication and see then it's fine, we can do that. But the best way to deal with fibroids, especially big fibroids that are totally symptomatic and you come because you have pain and you have pregnancy problems, falling pregnant problems and all of those things, the best thing to do is an operative treatment. In the operation, we have two options, depending on whether you still want to have your uterus or you have your family complete and you are ready to, you know. So we can take the fibroids out. The process is called myomectomy. Myomectomy means we take an L knife and cut just the surface, this brown surface, just cut this brown surface, and then we peel the fibroid out like we're peeling an orange. That incision would look like this. So we make a, a very, we make a very thin incision just on top of the uterus. Then we have to peel the uterus out. We have to peel the fibroid out. And once the fibroid has been peeled out, this is what comes out. These are balls. That's a one fibroid, a different size fibroid, a different size fibroid, a different size fibroid. So all of the structures that you see attached to the surface of the uterus, when you take them out, they look like that. A hysterectomy obviously is taking this out, the whole entire structure, especially if there's the, the fibroids are too big or too many and family conservation, you know, trying to have babies in the future is not a, is not a, um, a concern. So we can take the uterus out. Taking the uterus out is a huge operation. It's a very painful operation. It takes a bit of recovery. So we don't recommend that easily. You know, we, we assess each patient individually and if that's what you need, then that's what the, the treatment would be for that individual. It doesn't look like you guys are very fond of hysterectomy, that is removing the uterus, whatever the circumstances. But if it were for the reasons of a fibroid, why would you want to remove the whole uterus? Hysterectomy offers uh, a special avenue. That's the only time when you are sure that the fibroid will never come back. So that's the only thing that, okay. that you Just hold it there. Do you want to suggest to me, Dr. Untadid, that removing a fibroid from a uterus and maintaining the integrity of the uterus, leaving the uterus behind, does not guarantee that it can grow again. Yes, it, it, it will definitely grow back again. Definitely. It's a, it's a, it's a temporary right. procedure. Yeah. If, if you are a patient who's suffering from fibroids, and we do a myomectomy as described before, mm -hmm. meaning taking out the fibroids and leaving the womb behind, mm -hmm. you are surely going to run into problems of fibroids I later see. in life, okay. unless you are approaching menopause. Okay. If you approach menopause, then there is that possibility that you might not suffer from the fibroids uh, as much as someone who, who is remote from menopause. So obviously in younger patients who still have ambitions of uh, uh, having children and all of those, you'd, you'd much prefer to do a myomectomy where you, you try to remove the fibroid without interfering much with the, with the uterus. But obviously mm. if there are many fibroids and there are big fibroids or whatever, 
your, your, your approach would be slightly different? I would go as far as to just not limit it to just young women. A woman of any age mm. who has fibroids that are causing them problems of whatever nature, we must always um, go all out not to do any operation that is unnecessarily too drastic. Mm. A hysterectomy is a major surgery. Mm. And for many women, it has implications that are not only physical recovery from a major operation, which is going to keep them from work for a long time, but average, also there's a psychological... How about it stay from work after a hysterectomy is what? Well, it depends on whether you're having it mm. laparoscopically, vaginally, mm. or, or, um, or, or abdominally. Yeah, which but also, average, there's a yeah. psychological aspect mm. to it. Okay. Um, previously, uh, little, not enough attention has been given to the psychological effects of women having their uteruses removed. A lot of women quite relate to their uteruses as their center of femininity. Mm. And if really there are other alternatives of relieving whatever problem they're presenting with, whether it's bleeding, whether it's pain, if there's other alternatives that can get rid of those symptoms uh, other than removing their uterus, certainly that is the way we should go. But there are instances where it might become the only option, where uteruses are just too big that it is just not possible to remove the fibroids and leave behind any identifiable uterus. That's the only time that it should be. And then also there is a body of women also that are, that are quite comfortable and quite keen to have their uterus. So if, if, it's dry, if it's being driven by the patient, then certainly. But women should not just be offered the removal of their uterus as a hysterectomy just because there is a fibrosis causing some pain, causing some bleeding, when there are many other options of treating them. Now, you spoke about something that is often overlooked in your view, and that is to say that women who are removing or who are advised to remove their uteruses or their womb there is no consideration given to the fact that the womb is at the center of a woman's femininity. Can I gossip with you quickly? Do you think these guys, the male gynecologists, do hysterectomy which is much regularly than you guys, ladies, because maybe they are not, they are not in touch with that You know, I have a lot of colleagues that are male that hold the same <laughs> views that I do. A lot of them that are, have yeah. been my teachers, yeah, yeah. that are my mentors, okay. mm. that actually have, have, have shaped my mindset okay. with, the, with, yeah. with the, where I am now, with not rushing to just remove a uterus, I mean, at the drop of a head. Okay. No, well said. I know you wanted to very defend the point. <laughs> <laughs> gave a very good answer. We don't need to contaminate it. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Now, w would you find a woman who's got menstrual problems as a result of fibroids uh, that you guys cannot sort out by any other means than to suggest remove the womb? Mm. Yes, uh, there is a percentage of, of patients who will come with a fibroid and have menstrual problems that have had unsuccessful medical treatment mm. and unsuccessful minimal invasive treatment, uh, surgically speaking, and the only option that, is, that you are left with at the end of the day is a hysterectomy. So the fibroid continues to give the patient problems and problems day after day or month after month, and you are left with no option but to offer hysterectomy or in, in many cases, the, the, the patient herself will come in and say, Doctor, I've had enough with, with, with okay. suffering from the, the symptoms. Some it may be pain, just yes. pain. I said, look, yeah. I've had this pain because of, sure. the, of the fibroid, sure. and, and you guys have tried everything else. Yes. Can you just you yeah. know, uh, leave me of my misery? And, yes. and, and, and you can do it for that result. Sure. Now, let's talk about this pain. Mm. The insight and Dr. Parkway, they indicated something that you also alluded to, that because of the size and the positioning of the fibroid, it might begin to interfere with some of the neighboring structures. It can put pressure on the, on bladder, the bladder, leading to bladder, bladder problems of the current know, of bladder infections, of bladder infections, and all of that. It can it can interfere. As you can see there with the rectum with, at the back, with intestines the at the back. If it's very big, else. and they can have difficulty passing stools, painful now, passing stools. Now let's talk about pain. It the can pain. even cause in pain with sex, with well, intercourse. Painful sex? Yes. Yeah. That's a big problem. Mm. Just, okay, but we'll come back to that now. When you talk about pain, is, is the pain because of the pressure it puts on other organs or the fibroid itself can become painful? So the, depending on where the fibroid is, we must remember that when we get um, our menstrual period, it is because the lining inside the uterus, which is called the endometrium, has thickened, and then the uterus actually has m contractions mm. to push that blood out. So if there is a fibroid which is pushing into the cavity of the uterus, the uterus actually tries to push out of that fibroid 
and has very strong contractions. When the fibroid is inside it or right in the wall, if it's right on the outside, it usually doesn't cause pain. But actually, w some women will have pain that feels like they are in labor oh, no. every time they get a period. So they get a dysmenorrhea or painful menstruation that, that feels that like that they are in labor. labor. Yes, That's because the contractions of yeah. the uterus are trying to push out the fibroid as if they're trying to deliver a baby. Is, is there something you can do just before to the go to the, for those, mm -hmm. who, because usually to be a young woman, she's still menstruating, mm -hmm. she's got painful menstruation as a result of the fibroid, pain so much that it can be almost be likened to labor itself. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in which maybe you can just shrink the fibroid and, and make it smaller so that those symptoms can go away without necessarily removing the fibroid? as my, my male trauma that was described by the insect. Can you? The, there's one or two ways that have been suggested. Ah, I leave it at that. So that yeah. Bangladesh Hamba by him have been bustling the gun. We'll continue our discussion on fibroids when we return. Welcome back. You're watching Porita's House Call here on SABC2. And today we are discussing not fibroids, but uterine fibroids. Because you can have fibroids in other parts of the body that are muscular. But this time we are concentrating on uterine fibroids. Dr. Ontadile Matlach. You have a middle name. What is the middle, what is the middle name again? First name is Khauntebali. And Haun middle name is Ontadile. Yeah, Khauntebali yeah. Mudimu. Yes. Mudimu That's yes. a beautiful name. Hey? It's a beautiful name. Yeah. Credit goes to my parents. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> I agree. Credit I, goes I, to my parents. I, I would rather take the credit. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you didn't give yourself sure. the name. Khauntebali <laughs> Ontadile yeah. Beautiful. Okay, let's go back to what you said before the yeah. break. You said if you wish to maneuver and, and, and shrink this, it can be. How, how exactly can that be achieved? The, there's two approaches, basically. Mm. Medically, you can try with hormones. Can you take this model and demonstrate, you know, yes. with the model and show so, us exactly? So, if you, if you look at this model. Okay, let's face it this way and then. It it's got the. Um, us, correct. Yeah. It, it's, got, it's got a loop that, that came with the model. Okay. And this loop sometimes has got hormones in it yeah. that, that are released into the myometrium, into the wall of the womb, okay. Okay. slowly. And that hormone, to some degree, would would slow down the growth of the of the of the of the fibroid. Is that so? It does not so you necessarily put a it does not necessarily shrink the fibroid. No, but hang on. You put the loop inside. Yes. And the loop is producing some hormone. Yes. Which one? Progesterone, estrogen. Progesterone. Progesterone. It's slowly releasing this hormone yeah. into the wall of the uterus yes. where you'd find your fibroids, and that I see. and those are the ones that predominantly cause your pain. So you're not putting a loop to prevent pregnancy here. You are putting a loop Both. to to do. Oh, okay. Both. But if you have, if you have a fibroid, you are, we're quite unlikely to fall pregnant anyway. But but that's yes, a separate matter. But this yeah. loop will do both. I the, see. The newer loop. Yes. Okay. Interesting. And, and 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 that's the medical aspect. I see. Or even the oral progesterone. Sometimes people go on the oral progesterone. Okay. But uh, the surgical uh, approach mm. would be something called uterine artery embolization. Okay. Where uterine artery, artery embolization. embolization. And okay. there the target is the blood supply to the fibroid. Okay. And it's a radiological procedure. Mm. It's done in the X-ray department. Okay. And they send particles to the fibroid in an attempt okay. to, to slow down or cut the blood supply. So to you, the actual you block mass. the artery yes. that is feeding the fibroid yes. with the hope that once yes. you block the, the, uh, the, the blood supply, yeah. there'll be uh, oxygen supply will also be blocked. And as a result of that, the fibroid itself will begin to shrink. Sure. Okay. So it will just shrink, it won't die completely. Some of it, depending on the size. Yeah. And there's a lot of success there. I see. And most, most of the time, if the size is, is correct, if you choose the patients carefully, correct. you can actually shrink it to almost nothing. Okay. And yeah, like I said, it depends on the size. And yeah, it's, it's, it's quite successful, but you've got to choose your it's patients. It's done in South Africa as well. Yes. Okay. You've got to choose your patients carefully. Everything and then else, you've got to choose your patients carefully, isn't it, Justin? Yes. Yeah. And then the newer uh, methods that, that you can read in the literature is, your, is the MRI, guided focused ultrasound, almost like the way they would, they would do the renal stones. I see. But that's, that's a bit more expensive okay. and, and quite recent. MRI, magnetic resonance yes. imaging sense, it's a better sure. type of sure. x-ray, which sure. it shows it much yeah. more than just the bones, but other, other structures. Mm -hmm. Can you hold on to this? I, I, like, I like this, uh, because I'm going to, my, my next question is that, Dr. Pakwe spoke about mm -hmm. fibroids or uterine fibroids and infertility. 
Can you show us exactly how fibroids can lead to a woman not falling pregnant in the first place? Okay, for a woman to fall pregnant. N not to fall pregnant. Yeah. What is that a woman yeah. is not falling pregnant because of the fibroids and you, you're trying to remove the fibroids because you want to improve their chances of falling pregnant? So the ways in which fibroids can interfere with a woman falling pregnant mm. is by getting in the way of fertilization. Okay. For a woman to actually fall pregnant and conceive, sperm has to pass through the uterus mm. unhindered, uninterfered okay. with, find their way through the fallopian tubes and in the tube fertilize, that's it's going to meet fertilize the, egg. the egg in the in tube. The tube. Yeah. Okay. So <coughs> now if you have fibroids mm. that are so many or so big that they are causing compression and therefore distorting the cavity of the uterus, mm. then semen with sperm can find it difficult to make their to way through the, the cavity of the uterus. Yeah. And then you can also have a fibroid that is growing in the wall of the uterus, in the area of the tube, and therefore compress the tube and block it. And another way is that even if the semen with sperm does go through, fertilize the egg, that fertilized egg needs to come back and implant and develop into a fetus inside the uterus. If there are fibroids that are distorting and causing irritation and inflammation inside the cavity of the uterus, then that embryo can't implant. In, are you saying, therefore, to me, mm. <coughs> that if you've got fibroids in the way of the sperm moving through the uterus the into uterus the fallopian tube, that uh, an, an agile sperm can find its way into the tube and fertilize an egg? It Having done happen. that, when the fertilizer ovum now needs to travel into the uterus, then it, that can it, be blocked. It can be blocked now and not find a place to develop. Then and you have also an ectopic pregnancy. Problem. Yes. Then you have an ectopic yeah. pregnancy. And then also another problem is that a conception can happen. Mm. The fertilized embryo finds its way here, but then compete for space with a big fibroid that is now occluding most of the cavity. Mm. And then it interferes with the growth of that baby, mm. normal growth, normal position. And lead to a miscarriage. And lead to a miscarriage. Or premature labor. Okay. No, or premature labor in certain yeah. cases. So if we are going to have a fibro that interferes with fertility, as Dr. Mseleuk has indicated, mm -hmm. you would be able to pick it up through the hysterosalpingogram that uh, uh, Dr. Pakwe indicated. <coughs> will you be able to do that? Or would you need an ultrasound? Or how exactly would you identify them that that is a problem? It, d it depends where this fibroid would be sitting. Mm. If the fibroid is, there we go. It yeah. is, is protruding into the inside of the uterus, yeah. then a hysterosalpingogram would be a, a, a very useful modality to invi to, to Do evaluate. you want to describe hysterosalpingogram quickly for us? Hysterosalpingogram basically is when we take radio opaque dye or a dye that you can see with x-ray mm. and we push it into the womb and fill up this cavity. It's done in the radiology department? Yes. Okay. And then it's, it's, it fills up this cavity, and you can see it coming out, and, and the dye will come and spill into the okay. pelvic So it traces the way cavity. and the passage yes. of the sperm in order to cause exactly. fertilization. And if there's so any blockage along yes. the way that you can see on x-ray, then you know that that woman is yes. going to have difficulty. So if there's the no leak or spillage, mm. uh, then you, you can assume that okay. the tubes are blocked. And if there's, there's a protrusion or, or you see a, an impression of a mass yes. into, the, into the uterine cavity, mm. you can assume that there's okay. a fibroid that is sitting okay. there. And therefore, the environment is, is not going to be conducive for implantation, growth, and, 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 and normal. Once you have identified those silly fibroids that, that interfere with, a, in, the, with fertility that way, are you able to remove them in such a manner that you can improve the chances of, of fertility? And again, because it's not only about uh, the sperm and the egg meeting. There's also about all the other processes mm. where now the fertilized ovum has to negotiate its way back into the uterus and where it can sit there for the required 37 weeks before the baby is born. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, that's a procedure that we do all the time. Mm. Um, we can remove fibroids in different ways. I mean, we, 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 we should endeavor, though, to do it in such a way that is um, the, most, um, the least painful with the quickest recovery for the patient but that's also affected by whether it is possible to do so. There are many women that will present with fibroids that are small, that are just in a perfect position to do it with a minimal surgery, what we call a laparoscopy. I see. Okay, laparoscopy. Well, can do it yeah. through keyhole surgery. Keyhole yeah. surgery. Hold it there. Yes. Hold it there. We'll continue our discussion on fibroids after the break. Stay with us.
welcome back. When this was after the council of the city, more of our sound house call for FM 2 in the name of the city. And we are talking fibroids or uterine fibroids to be more specific. Minimal invasive surgery for removal of fibroids, as we we're saying, and as we're saying. Explain. The traditional way of uh, doing almost of all operations was to make a big cut on the abdomen. Mm. Uh, but there's been a huge shift. Wherever it's possible to make it through smaller cuts, the patient is going to recover quicker, going to have much less pain, going to be back at work in a week or two as opposed to four to six weeks. So a lot of women, though, will hear about this or read about this and will be demanded this, but it's not appropriate for everybody. But where it's possible, the fibroid has to be small, not too big. They can't, there shouldn't be too many. And they have to be in the right position. Uh, and when it's possible, then it should be nice. It's called laparoscopy. So it, traditionally, if a woman has an operation to remove fibroids and myomectomy through a big normal cut called a laparotomy, the hospital stay will be three, four nights and they'll be able to go to work only four to six weeks, which is really a lot. But if, it's, if they're small enough and they're well positioned enough with laparoscopic surgery, you go home the same day or only one night in hospital and you're back at work in, in about 10 to 14 days. It should appear that management of fibroids is becoming more and more of a highly specialized area. And mm. I think possibly because not two fibroids are the same and not two women are the same. Mm and not two situations in the same women are the same. So, so you, you've got to deal with it carefully. Do you find now that you've got gynecologists who are super specialized in, in dealing with fibroids, or pretty much any gynecologist what they are sold should be able to deal with fibroids? The, there's two areas uh, in, in the super specialty where, where you specialize after specializing, mm. where you will find the gynecologist meeting or dealing with the fibroids. One of them is the fertility specialists or, or the doctors who deal with infertility. And the other one will be someone who has gone for training in minimal invasive surgery or the laparoscopic surgery. So the laparoscopic gynecologic surgeon will be dealing a lot with, uh, with fibroids. And the infertility uh, gynecologist will also be dealing a lot with, 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 uh, with fibroids. So in those two areas, you find that there's, there's a lot of work that's been done. Would you remove a fibroid purely for its size? It's, it's, it's big. Uh, I know you guys measure it almost like a pregnancy, like a pregnancy. that you've got a 12 mm -hmm. week or a 14 week or a 16 week, depending on what, what, what baby size of a uterus mm -hmm. it resembles. Would you remove a fibroid purely because of the size? It's not giving any symptoms whatsoever, no urinary symptoms, no rectal symptoms or constipation or anything. You just feel that no me sega mela police start to fight it begin or the sega no mkaba ngempela ngenxa yesigaxa would you recommend that they should remove you know it is very very rare mm. for a fibroid to be huge mm. and and not cause any symptoms and not cause any symptoms okay. first of all that mm. patient would not have come to me in the first place mm. uh, the ones that don't need to be removed mm. the patient is not going to come to a doctor about okay. them anyway so we don't get to know about them mm. so the ones that actually we get to know about them mm. is because in some way or other, that causing okay. a problem. Not only the figure, but the figure says the owner got Well, it's a woman's that's prerogative. A it's mm, a, that's it's a problem a, already. It's a woman's prerogative. <laughs> if, if it is causing a cosmetic, yeah. major cosmetic problem, it, it is a cosmetic that is a well enough, a good enough reason to remove okay. it. Let's say now you have a woman. Uh, they, they came in uh, for another problem. Sure. And you identify as you're examining them. Uh, what we call a routine examination and you find what you call an incidental finding mm -hmm. something that somebody did not complain about but you pick up in your investigation pick up that woman has got a few fibroids and he said listen just to tell you as i was investigating for this i was, I was looking for gallstones and uh, we did a sonar and we found that you got three or four fibroids mm -hmm. they are not causing you any problem at this moment because you did not even know that you've got them and we're going to take what we call a conservative approach. You're not going to do anything about them. Sure. Now, when they go away, as a responsible doctor, you need to say to them, unless one, two, three, four happen, come back to me with those fibroids. What are those things that if they happen and you've got fibroids, you know that you've got to go and see the doctor again? Sure. So if, if the fibroid is just sitting there, it's small, it's doing nothing, you also do no harm. Correct. You okay. leave it alone. Okay. Then you say to the patient, if the fibroid gives you pain, okay. any of the symptoms, pain, if, if you start having bleeding problems, menstrual problems, your cycle becomes longer or your flow increases, mm. 
or the period becomes painful, then you come back. In other words, you are saying it. if you have these symptoms, yes. it, it, it doesn't matter whether they are caused by the fibroids or not. Yes. Come back come because back. they might be related to the fibroids. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So it is pain, sure. it is change in menstruation. Sure. What else? And if you happen to be you know, trying to conceive and you're struggling to conceive I at see. that point in time, Correct. you know you've been told that there was an incidental finding. Okay. Maybe now this fibroid is it's acting up and causing okay. problems uh, okay. with conception. So you come back okay. and you, you have a look at the fibroid, you reassess at that time what's happening with the fibroid okay. and then you take it from there. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have pain, if you have bleeding, and if you suddenly have an impression of a mess after many years, this takes a, a bit of time. After some time, you, you start having a message. You start feeling that yes. there's something. Th yeah. Then you can come back, you, 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 you have a look. Okay. If you start having neighboring organs, mm. uh, uh, having problems, your, your bladder and you have urine infections, you have constipation, you've got GIT, gastrointestinal mm. uh, problems or complaints, then you come back and you have a look at the, at the fibroid. Perhaps that's where the mm. problem is coming from. According to Aishir, painful sex. Mm. You said that can be caused. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how does that happen? So, depends on the position of the fibroid. Okay. Uh, on the whole uterus. So, which I type of fibroid would cause uh, okay. that kind of problem? So, there's fibroids, incidentally, if they're very big and they're just anywhere and they're causing discomfort, even sex uh, will cause discomfort. Mm. But typically, you can have fibroids that are positioned quite low on the cervix, like on the mouth of the womb. Or some of them can even. Uh, protrude and and be sticking out of the cervix which is at the top of the vagina and when inter during intercourse then there will be trauma to that fibroid it will cause pain okay. it can cause also bleeding just before I go to the air break mm. now a woman comes to you you discover that she's pregnant she's about 12 weeks pregnant 14 weeks pregnant mm. and you also see that there's a fibroid that she did not know they had and uh, that fibroid might interfere with the pregnancy as we said, it can lead to early labor, it can lead to all manner of problems and, you know, uh, abnormal lie, a breach instead of whatever. What do you do? Once a woman is already pregnant, um, all the usual forms of trying to treat a fibroid pose too much risk to the pregnancy. Okay. So the thing is to just observe it and watch it. The most common problem that they cause really, the small ones, because when they're falling pregnant, usually they're not very big, okay. otherwise they would have prevented would them have from falling, falling, they wouldn't have fallen pregnant mm -hmm. anyway. We just have to warn her about the possibility that when she's pregnant, they tend to cause pain. Okay. Yeah, pain that can be worrying during about the pregnancy. Issues. During the pregnancy, yeah. can be worrying that there's something wrong, is she having a miscarriage? But we need to warn her so that she knows every time she has severe pain. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, though, we just manage the pain. So with the, during the pregnancy, our estrogen level, the hormone estrogen goes very high, and it can make the fiber grow a little bit faster than it normally does, mm -hmm. and then it can cause a lot of pain. But usually we just give uh, very strong painkillers, but it can be so severe that women need admission to hospital just to manage the pain. But they have to treat that pregnancy as a precious pregnancy. Any small Absolutely, complaint, because mama there. It, mm. when it's positioned in certain places, mm. it can, like I said, I cause the, the baby to be positioned abnormally, which mm. will prevent a normal birth and will force a cesarean section. Mm. It can cause premature water breaking. Mm. It can cause also premature labor. But the thing is, uh, once there's a fibroid, that pregnancy needs to be monitored more closely than a pregnancy ah. that doesn't have anything wrong with it. But we'll round up our discussion on fine boys when we return. We stay with us. You're watching Bonita's House Calling yeah, on SABC2 and welcome back. Bakay. All I can say to the folks at home is that if you, if you go and see your gynecologist regularly, we will pick up the fibroid and we will treat it accordingly. No two fibroids are the same. 
each fibroid is, is pretty much like pregnancy. No two pregnancies are the same. And the approach to any fibroids would be individualized. It has to be a discussion between you and the patient and really see what is bothering the patient and address the, the problem with the right solution. So there's no template. Not every patient will get the same treatment for the same problem. society and then they put pressure or expectation no, on, their, no. on their friends, go society, this is how you deal with fibroids. Each and every case is unique sure. and Absolutely. has to be dealt yeah. with it in that manner. My yeah. take home message on fibroids is that women that get diagnosed with fibroids must not panic, must not feel like it's the end of the world or the end of their lives with their uteruses. Women need to know that there are many different options of treating fibroids. You, it's not just a hysterectomy. And, and they're entitled to seek information and look at the different options, discuss them with somebody who's knowledgeable, and uh, find out what is the best treatment for their own fibroids. One single myth associated with fibroids that you have come across in practice, what is it? Well, it's a misconception that when you have fibroids, you're gonna, ha you're gonna have a hysterectomy, mm. which is not true. So people who have hysterectomies because of fibroids, it is because they have end it. It's because th they happen to be women that had such mm. big and so many fibroids mm. that the other forms of treatment don't apply and or are not appropriate for those women. But there are many women for whom the other alternatives of treating fibroids, medical treatment, an intrauterine device, uterine embolization, myomectomy will be the best treatment for those women. I then guys now go to a loop. Yeah, was good it treated a fibroid. As you can say, you said the uh, intrauterine device can be can achieve that purpose. But colleagues, let's have a deal. You said that the estrogen is a big problem. We need to have a show on Bonita's house called dedicated to this thing called the estrogen. But for now, thank you very much, Dr. Antatidamatlaka, Dr. Malipuna. Thank you ever so much, guys, and I'm sure we'll come back, get you back into the studio to come and talk about estrogen. But thank you very much for sharing your information and your knowledge and experience with us. We'll be back next Saturday with the health challenges in their minds. South Africa's most active form of industry. And to be next week Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning or 8.30 in the morning on Bonita's House Call. Arko pa nangapi he, beke nge tlang tato haile ya mreen. Thanks for joining us today. From me, Dr. Victor Ramoresi Ramatisele, ya khaula yae. Kina mani se, kimta ngomle tsa. Ute.